Oh my god, I'm gonna count you down, Hardy. No, 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 no. I'm gonna. Are you gonna count today. me down? Y yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna count you down, and you'll you'll take us in. I I will take this privilege for myself. All right. So, five, four. Welcome to another episode of Talking Kotlin. This episode is brought to you by Go On Protein Bars. Actually, it's not, but oh, I got one of these free and they're quite good. Um, I, if you're into the whole protein thing, you know, high protein, low carb, you should try one of these. Go on, go on, try it. Sponsorships work, it. apparently. Apparently, right? <laughs> they're not, they're um, not even paying you, hey, Hardy. They're not, and I, I hope we don't get sued for this. Uh, but yeah, so Seb, how you been? How you been doing? I am ecstatic today because I found out something yesterday, and, and I actually I need to tell you this real quick. So I live I live in like a suburb of Munich, right? Uh, and it's it's just like regular housing where like people live. There's no like offices or nothing like that, and there's also pretty much like no commerce. But I found out that there's a an ice cream manufacturer in like my area of town and they have like a factory outlet like it's like in the middle of nowhere and i can go there at any time of the day I, like at 3 a.m and you, they just have a box and you put in a little bit of money and you get like individually packaged like proper ice cream and this is this has made my week so far it's i'm i'm just taking a walk there <laughs> like every day and grabbing like a, a pint of ice cream well, that's actually quite cool. Um, I guess now you just need good weather to make that even more enjoyable. Or do you still do it when it's like minus four and snowing and <laughs> I'll go time. and have myself an ice cream? Last it's like, time I did it, it was four degrees Celsius and I had one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Apparently you do like the ice cream stuff. Yeah, it's, It speaks to the quality of the ice cream more than anything. Yeah. Actually, my favorite ice cream store here in Malaga um, is called uh, Ima. Uh, which is short for Immaculada, which is uh, the Spanish Immaculate. And um, they, they set up, I think, in 1972 or 73, around the same age I was born. And it's amazing. I just love their ice creams. The problem is that they only open from April to about October. So the rest of the year, you're just like, well, tough luck. Have some crappy manufactured nonsense. No winter ice cream for you, huh? Yeah, but anyway, uh, but it's actually nice weather here. Is you know talking about oh we haven't talked about the weather for a while. It's it's actually quite nice here. It's like nineteen twenty degrees Celsius. Sun is shining, beautiful, and here I am stuck with you indoors again. But good, good, good thing is that I'm not just stuck with you, right? We we have a guest today, don't we? <laughs> what what a delightful introduction of our guest. Yeah, we're sitting down today with uh, Margarita uh, Netzelska, who's a software engineer at Sona Source. Hi, Margarita. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Just okay. uh, so that I want, I would like to have an ice cream too, right now, because mm. you were talking about it a lot. <laughs> Um, I mean, generally, we, we, we really don't, uh, to be honest, we really didn't, don't uh, care how our guests are doing. We just have to say that to get the pleasantries <laughs> over and done with. But I, and, uh, obviously, I'm and, joking. It's, it's, it's great that you're doing well. Uh, I Actually, last time I saw you was in uh, Kotlin Conf, wasn't it? Uh, if you're talking about in person, yeah, it was in Kotlin Conf uh, 2019 yes. in Copenhagen. Yeah, no, before that, you were on a guest uh, podcast of like the 10-year anniversary of, of Kotlin. I am old, but my memory is still, what was I going to say? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, my <laughs> memory is still. Right. Um, so, yes, we're going to talk today about, uh, because when, uh, um, what's his name? Oh, yes, Seb. When, when Seb said that he's static, ecstatic i heard static and of course we're going to be talking about static analysis today aren't we right because what does your company do 
the company I work for is called Sooner Source, and we are actually working on static code analysis for different languages. I guess we have 27 supported languages. Like there are some mainstreams so like Java, C Sharp, uh, C++, and uh, so on. And we also have some COBOL analyzer, Apex analyzer, and uh, like there are a lot of different languages there. And we also have an analyzer for Kotlin. And I assume that's something that you want to talk about more. Well, no, actually, I was interested to see if you have a Delphi analyzer. Actually, no, this is a serious question. Do you have a static analysis analyzer for Delphi or Delphi? I think nope. And yet you have it for COBOL. Yeah, but you know where money is. <laughs> <laughs> there's money in Delphi. There's probably more money in COBOL. Oh, wait, is there money in COBOL? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of money Maybe in COBOL. Make an ID for COBOL. <laughs> Damn, I guess there, make an idea. there's a lot of money and uh, I guess it's because of their, um, not a lot of people know COBOL and not a lot of people can maintain projects in COBOL. So they are paid a lot yeah. and projects written in COBOL, uh, they like uh, stuck in the maintenance and nobody can rewrite them in any other language. And I guess there are also systems that are really like impactful, right? So I, I think I think it's a lot in insurances, banks, and, and like a lot of like infrastructure, like the classic mainframe applications, right? So, and that there's a there's a very famous saying, uh, or is it a saying? I don't know if it's a saying, but you know they say like the, as the as you can be a you can be a small fish in a big ocean, or you can be a big fish in a small pond, right? So. In the COBOL world, it's a very small pond, but you're like really big fish because you get to eat it all, right? Because there is like in reference to the high paid salaries and, and stuff like that, right? You know, but then anyway, talking about fish. Yes, Seb, you were going to ask a question. <laughs> Here my, we go. My tangents. Class, <laughs> classic segue as well. Yeah. Go so... on. Ask a question. Go on. <laughs> all right. So, Margarita, t tell us a little bit about what, what those static analyzers uh, do for people, maybe just so everyone's on the same page. Yeah, in simple words, we are trying to make uh, the code a little bit better. So we try to analyze uh, your source files, try to make some assumptions and to like, notify you if you have some possible bugs there or some code smells, or you can just rewrite something in a better way. In our company, we have three main products. Uh, the first one is SonarCube. It's, I guess, the most known one. It's an application that you can install on your server and uh, you can analyze with it a lot of your projects, just adding a few commands to your build pipelines. Um, then we'll actually have a cloud version for this. It's Sonar Cloud. It's another project. And we also have some uh, plugin for different IDEs called SonarLint, and this SonarLint is available for different IDs, like for IntelliJ, for Android Studio, also for VS Code, for like PyCharm, CLion, and uh, a lot of different IDs. Talking about linters, I want to get this once and clear for all. For me and for everybody out there listening, is a linter covering formatting also is it only formatting? Is it static analysis and formatting? Is it everything? Is it one or the other? Good question, right, Seb? It is. Absolutely. I've never thought of this. <laughs> yeah, that's, I guess, um, the question of terminology. Uh, in, uh, in our exact analyzer, we are not doing a check of styles. Uh, like we, we have a couple of rules, but that's more not they're not about the style, they're just about maybe your headers that you have proper license or something like this. But we are not checking your like uh, style issues, for example, what KTLIN does. But we do, we can integrate, we can read the reports from KTLIN, from like, other linters, for example, if we are talking about JavaScript, it's ESLint. Uh, if we are talking about Java, it's check style and... Uh, I got other stuff that uh, so we can read it. We can show you these issues, but our analyzers are more focused on the code smells, on bugs, on some security vulnerabilities, but not on uh, the like formatting. 
and the functionality um, that you offer in the in the IDE plugins and and the parts that you can plug into your CI pipeline, are they the same, or is there uh, more functionality available in one or the other? In the beginning, it was like the same because it's the same analyzer, and uh, the analyzer is used like everywhere in three products. Uh, but uh, recently, we trying to add some features that are more relevant for one or another product. For example, in Sooner Lint, we recently added uh, quick fixes. Uh, it, um, they added them for Java. We plan to add it for C++. Uh, and uh, probably next year, we'll have more languages who are supporting this. Because before this, Sunner Lean just reported you that you have a problem here. You can you can substitute it with some other code. You can rewrite it, refactor, but we never like uh, have this button to actually do it for you. And now we have it in Java, and probably we'll have it in other languages. So I have to ask, uh, how is this different uh, to, for instance, some of the stuff that we have in IntelliJ IDEA? Is it is it basically enhancing on that? On, on the same uh, principle? Uh, I think it's like enhancing on the same principle, but uh, of course we have different rules because we have different like uh, uh, different people working on it, different focuses. And uh, for example, um, recently we tried to switch our focus more into security, not only cost quality. And uh, like we have a lot of uh, security rules uh, for example, for Kotlin, we recently added a few for Android security and for server-side security issues. And we also have a big security analyzer that is actually doing some kind of uh, taint analysis, trying to understand where SQL injections could possibly be or some other dangerous stuff. Unfortunately, it's not yet available for Kotlin because our Kotlin analyzer is uh, only starting the, his evolution, its evolution, uh, but it's available for Java and for JavaScript and for like most of the modern and big players on the market. Uh, so in our way, we are more focused on security. And I guess that we like complement something that we have in IDE. Sometimes we overlap in the rules, sometimes not, but I think that we it's nice to have both. So what you're essentially saying is that Kotlin doesn't have any security vulnerabilities, right? <laughs> Did you see how I twisted that? Elegant. That's that's years of that's years of communication history. But m maybe more exactly. more seriously, is is there like a is there a certain point uh, of or a certain like code pattern where where people do introduce? Uh, security vulnerabilities in their application that's that's particularly uh, popular. Um, that's uh, hard to say, maybe because I'm not really a good security expert. So what I'm seeing, what issues are raising the most uh, issues are the ones uh, about um, cryptography, uh, about using some weak uh, hashing algorithms, about using weak random, uh, because like there is a secure random. Uh, which you can use for, for example, for salt, and there is a simple random, which is kind of predictable. It should not be used in generating salt when you're doing some cryptography, and people are uh, usually forget about it. So they're using some old algorithm. It, I, I'm guessing that if, if there's any function in there that that has the uh, the suffix or prefix rot thirteen, you you, you should probably be <laughs> highlighting that and saying, yeah, don't you don't want to do that. But actually, as a as kind of a, a another question, now that you say, well, uh, maybe security isn't is, isn't like your expertise, um, but you may have some other expertise. Where do the rules in general come from that you implement? Um, it depends. They come from like everywhere. First of all, it's uh, specification. For example, you read some new feature that appeared in Kotlin, or for example, in Java, you read this JEP, and there are some like um, paragraphs that are saying how you can misuse it and what can go wrong. And it's basically already a, a prepared rule for you. So you just specify it and then you can implement. Nice. Uh, then what we did with my colleagues, uh, we had some sprints uh, to think about, to, to try, for example, new, uh, new features in Java, like records, like sealed classes, and uh, try to think what can go wrong, how I can misuse it, and uh, like what will happen. 
and we wrote some rules about serialization of records, about uh, like some stuff like overriding equals uh, hash code and to string methods. If, for example, your uh, data class or your record in Java have some field with array, and you know that uh, the fault implementation with hash codes and equals will actually compare by reference, but sometimes you probably need deep equality. So it's also a rule that we can think of. And it's like coming from our head uh, by just realizing how we can misuse it. And another possible way of getting new rules, it's uh, our community. We have our community forum and people often suggest new rules. And that in most cases it actually work for some frameworks because as far as we are working mostly with analyzers, we are not much into frameworks like Spring, Hibernate, Micronaut, and all this stuff. And uh, people who are actually using it uh, can suggest a lot of nice rules. So we are also like having inspiration from this. So that's actually a good uh, segue. You see, I'm good at segues. Uh, you mentioned frameworks. You don't just restrict yourself then to languages do you also cover frameworks uh we try to uh it's still uh, like hard because uh, uh there are a lot of different frameworks we would like to cover them but we just don't have much expertise in it because it's impossible to have um, but if there is some nice role and there is some traction from our community we try to add it and uh, I know that in Java Analyzer, we have some uh, rules about Spring. We also, I guess, duplicated a few of them into Kotlin. And uh, what, what else we plan to do something on cloud functions, for example, for Amazon Lambdas and uh, some specific rules that are not only about the language, but also about some framework. And so, uh, I think that's a good idea, especially if the framework is widely used. Do you also collect some kind of like statistics about like what uh, what like the the biggest code smells are? Maybe like what patterns people misuse the most or that you see the most in the wild? Uh, I think we we are collecting something, uh, but. Uh, um, Unfortunately, most or fortunately, most of our customers are using Sonar Cube. It's not Sonar Cloud, and it's a little bit harder to gather all the statistics from Sonar Cube because you just install it on your server. Uh, but we definitely collect some metrics from Sonar Cloud. Uh, but that's not just for curiosity about the rules. It's more about the precision, uh, because of course, as we cannot. Like it's impossible to do the perfect analyzer. We will always have some false positives, false negatives. And we try to measure like how precise we are, what is the rate of false negatives, false positives. And uh, if we see like that we are reporting a lot of false negatives, maybe there's something wrong with the role, we need to like, improve it. Uh, so that's, that's not uh, like exactly what you're asking, but uh, that's more about uh, we try to use it in order to make our rules better. Do you go to sources such as Stack Overflow to find uh, ugly patterns of how people use code? Um, usually, no. But uh, during the sprint about specifying uh, new rules about new Java features, I uh, tried to go whenever I could to find some interesting patterns. and. Uh, I read some articles, like some uh, questions, some solutions on Stack Overflow. But I guess the most uh, informative were not these uh, questions. The most informative were some articles from people who, uh, like from Oracle or actually from JetBrains, who are developer advocates, just had uh, thought about That's what us. could go wrong. Yeah. So she's talking yeah. about us. <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure uh, who was the author. Maybe it was um, maybe Trisha or maybe Mala. But somebody wrote a very nice article because about Java 16 features. And uh, that was really like informative. And if you don't want to read the whole JEPS, uh, you can just read this article and uh, get the knowledge about what happened in Java 16. Yeah, that's that's Mala. She she does an amazing job at covering all of the language features uh, from each version of of Java and, and does great summaries. Okay, well, never mind. It wasn't about us. 
<laughs> you know, I once wrote an article. Uh, but uh, talking about articles, <laughs> I've got to stop doing these go. nonsense yeah. segues. No, but so you said that it's hard to get statistics uh, from you know your users because obviously most of them are using the on-premise version, right? And and that is a pain point that I think the majority of companies that do on-premise tools such as ourselves run into, right? Um, whereas if you're using cloud services, nobody asks you, hey, can I lock all the information that you're using? We just kind of assume we're going to, right? What is the biggest code smell that you have kind of encountered yourself in the case of Kotlin? Has there been any specific feature that has led to a lot of people ending up with doing it in a bad way, leading to whatever code smell is? I think um, that's a good question. Uh, mine may be the most annoying thing that I always, I always done. So we tried, we implemented a rule for it. It's an induced import uh, because we didn't have the rule for it. And if you like, don't uh, look at the file in IntelliJ, you can actually miss it. And our quality gates, our uh, scenario group instance won't report anything and we merge it. And then you open and you see that you have this induced import and uh, that's the ugly. And we implemented the rule. But I, I'm not sure like it's like the, the hardest code smell because like if you have it or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just like ugly. It looks not really nice for me in code. And uh, uh, about other possible uh, code smells, that's hard to say because uh, Kotlin is kind of still a new language. There are a lot of nice features that you can use and you can make code really pretty and concise when you're writing it. But sometimes when I'm reading the code written in Kotlin with all this, uh, like, let apply with functions, with all this destructuring, with extension functions coming from somewhere, and that's hard to read. It uh, looks difficult. Did yeah, you get like, it? 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 Uh, yeah. So it's like, uh, it was easy to write. It was completely understandable for the person who wrote it. But when you're reading it, it's uh, it's very hard. It's like almost the way what Scala does. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. they do everything Just... for writing concise code. Uh, but... Um, when you're reading it, uh, you cannot review it because it's hard. You need to an IDE in order to like uh, go to these declarations to find out where from where actually this function comes and what it actually does. So I think the biggest problem in Kotlin is uh, when you overuse all these possibilities. But but you're saying that we need an IDE, so we're doing a good job, right? Because I mean that was part of the plan, yeah. <laughs> we get people to, to buy our IDEs. Um, I guess where it failed is where we're giving away an IDE for free. We didn't think about that, did we? Oh, never mind. Yeah, and that on the one hand, yes, because it's like your business, so you're uh, doing a good job. You provide really nice language. And then in order to review pull requests, everybody needs IDs because it's almost impossible to review it in GitHub, like if you want to do a normal review. Uh, but still, uh, I think some the misuse and overuse of all this uh, Kotlin like, nice um, features uh, can be a bad pattern, but we don't have a rule for it. We, we have some small rules uh, for some parts of this. But I cannot say uh, like how to to tell that the, the code looks complex and uh, looks not readable because it's actually a very subjective opinion. It's uh, like personal opinion, not something that actually machine can recognize. Do you also integrate uh, some kind of code quality metrics, uh, like the some kind of testability score, cyclomatic complexity, this kind of stuff, and tell people like? hey, your methods are getting a little long, a little complex, a little nested. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, we um, implemented this um, um, cyclomatic complexity, which is a known metric. Uh, but uh, I guess a few years ago in Sinner Source, uh, there was a, a paper about uh, cognitive complexity. It's introduced by Sinner Source. It's a different metric. Uh, it just... Uh, you can read about it uh, in our, on our site, about what's it about. It's actually extending this cyclomatic complexity metric. And uh, 
the main the main idea of this is nesting for example if you're adding some additional ifs else uh, some additional lambda for example like in kotlin you have let apply these functions and if you are chaining them uh you not only increase the complexity you also increase the nesting and uh, the nesting level uh, like doubles the value of complexity. So, for example, if you have just simple if, it will bring you like plus one to complexity. But if this if is inside the lambda, your complexity will be plus two. And if it's like in a second nested lambda, it will be plus three and so on, so on. And uh, I think this one is really good. Uh, really, we have this rule. Uh, but uh, the problem is that what should be the default value for like minimum uh, cognitive complexity? Because uh, we still, in order to trigger the rule to say that, okay, your method is too complex, you need to have this, uh, this number, this exact number. And uh, that's hard to actually to identify what it should be. But I guess from another side, it, it would be a good way to reach a consensus across a team, right? Because if you think about it, when one person does a code review of someone else's code, as, we, as you just said, it's very biased and it's very opinionated. And yet, if you have some kind of uh, you know, default values and say, okay, the cognitive complexity has to always be three or below, right? then it becomes a little bit more objective when you're doing these code reviews, right? You can highlight and say, well, okay, you know, this isn't in line with the parameters that we're defining as a team or as a company. Um, yeah, that's actually what we propose and what we try to do. I'm just talking that even this approach is not ideal, but at least it brings something like alignment uh, in the team or even in the company. And, but anything that takes away that kind of like, well, I think your code is complex. Well, screw you. I think your code is way more complex than my code. Well, no, you go to, oh, never mind. Have a protein bar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you said a couple of times uh, when you talked about the Kotlin analyzer that we implemented uh, something. How many folks are, are working on the on the analyzer for Kotlin? Um, for full time, I, we are two. It's me and uh, another colleague, and we are like initial Kotlin enthusiasts who started this. And uh, the story was that uh, both of us, we were just like newcomers in the company. We both worked less than a year when we started this. So we needed some old timer who knows like how everything works in the company. We needed all this. Uh, so we were three, uh, but the actual development was done by two of us. And this uh, guy, old timer, he just helped us in more working, talking with PMs uh, in uh, set up in infrastructure, gaining permissions and so on and so on. This old timer, I, I feel so, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, old timer. Yeah. Get and, off uh, my lawn. Get off yeah. my lawn. But now we have some good news that uh, we actually merged some efforts with the team working on Java Analyzer, which I was a part of before joining Kotlin. And so we onboarded two more uh, developers to be able to work on our analyzer. So they um, they did some commits, implemented a few rules, so now they can work on it if needed. Uh, but still, they have a lot of work on Java Analyzer. So for the moment, it's still like two of us working full time. So how hard is it to actually analyze Kotlin as a language in comparison to, for instance, Java? Because, you know, one of the premises that we had when we first started creating Kotlin was that it's easily toolable. Is it? Well, that's a nice question. I think the first and the biggest problem uh, in analyzing Kotlin is actually Kotlin front-end that we need to integrate with and uh, get in uh, all the data like abstract syntax tree and semantics and so on. Uh, because uh, currently uh, the stable version is, uh, is PSI. So it's a program structure interface that is coming from IDEs. So if you just uh, have dependency on your embeddable Kotlin compiler, you're getting a lot of stuff from the IntelliJ as well to your dependencies. Yep. And so this is like the first problem that our Kotlin compiler is kind of fat. 
but uh, just because of dependency uh, the embeddable Kotlin compiler. Uh, for Java, it's uh, not like this because uh, we are using also third party compiler, which is Eclipse. And uh, it was like on purpose, the compiler, it was not integrated in the like, it was not coming from a Eclipse ID, it's just a standalone compiler. The API is a little bit better and that's why using it a little bit easier than Kotlin. But once you integrate with it, you just don't care anymore. So I don't think it's like very big deal, uh, but uh, the interface is not really convenient um, because uh, I would like to have something more of a, I don't know, abstract syntax tree or concrete syntax tree coming from Kotlin, which is Kotlin specific. But what we have now, it's, uh, more connected to program structure interface, which is coming from IDE. And as far as I understand, there are some ideas, there is already a solution for this. It's front-end intermediate representation. It's uh, the syntax tree that we would like to use in the future to write our rules on top of this. Uh, but currently, I guess it's, uh, in, it's not even in beta. It's uh, something that uh, that's not finalized, so we cannot rely on it to do some really reliable rules. We cannot use in our production, but we can definitely try it out, and maybe in a few years we'll uh, rewrite everything on this. And so, like the basic problem is actually this uh, program structure interface, uh, which is not an ideal, and uh, how to say it's not. Not really uh, something that you can understand from just reading what it means. Because uh, like, for example, we have kt named function. Uh, what do you think kt named function is? A, a function that has a name, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's like what everybody thinks. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to go out here and just, just assume that that's what it might be. <laughs> Yeah, and that was our assumption as well. So we assume that if code compiled and we have kt named function, the name should always be present. But <laughs> there are anonymous functions that doesn't have name. They don't have any name, but uh, they also kt named function. Why? Because kt named, fu named function is not about the name, it's that they named with fun keyword. O okay. <sighs> Yeah, it doesn't also make things simpler in, in Kotlin that there's a distinction between a lambda and an anonymous function. You know, in every other language, it's the same thing. Yeah, and there are like a lot of these small things that you assume that it's this just because it's like, it sounds obvious. But no, it's not like this and like uh, all this stuff. And uh, if we are talking about the semantics in Kotlin, it's like another pain point uh, that we have to deal with. What you're saying is that hopefully all of that will become better once front-end IR becomes a reality. Yeah, we hope so. Um, I don't know exactly because it's like not <laughs> implemented by us, but we really hope so. For now, you've always talked about the, the Kotlin analysis and the Java analysis as two separate parts. Are there any parts of those analyzers that kind of interop or uh, that, that help you when you have a... a a project that includes both both Java and Kotlin code? Um, yeah, currently, um, we have two separate analyzers, one for Java and another for Kotlin. Uh, but if you want to analyze the project uh, in Sonar Group that has both Java and Kotlin, uh, we will actually trigger both analyzers. So you'll get through like, some issues from Java and on Java files and some issues on Kotlin files. Uh, the thing is that like the problem is uh, that we are not doing this cross-file analysis and cross-file between languages because on uh, the stage when we are analyzing Kotlin code, uh, we don't have Java source code. We, we only have like uh, compiled, we only have class pass and bytecode. So we can do some assumptions from the, coming from bytecode. Um, but of course we cannot uh, like go deeper into the source of Java files. For the like uh, for the level of Kotlin analyzer at the moment, we we are not thinking that uh, we will do it in uh, in some amount of time in the nearest future. But um, 
uh, we were thinking that it will be nice to have this cross uh, Kotlin Java analysis for, for example, security, because like there are applications that are written both in Java and Kotlin. And if we want to detect some security vulnerabilities, some SQL injections, it's nice to have access to both. So one thing I wanted to ask you, because very early you mentioned on, uh, you said that uh, it's it's open source, right? Now, now I don't know about, because you live in Ukraine, right? Uh, no, by you live in Geneva. I relocated okay. when I joined Sooner Source. Okay, so um, I don't think that in Geneva you can pay mortgage or rent with open source code. Um, so... <laughs> That's a long and twisted way of saying, <laughs> so what is your business model around this if this is open source? Is it free or or how does it work? Um, the analyzer itself is open sourced and uh, and our customers are not paying like for analyzers. Uh, in most cases, they're paying for the products uh, for Sonar Coop and for Sonar Cloud. So there are different uh, editions. There is a community edition which is free. And there are also developer edition, enterprise edition, and so on. You can like, and there is, I guess, no uh, highest, uh, uh, non -top for, no top for the price you pay. So the more you configure, the more you can pay. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I see on your site that you've got like the, the community developer enterprise data center starting at 100,000 euros. Do you know how many protein bars you could buy for 100,000 euros? <laughs> I probably guess fifty thousand. If you got them for free, yeah. I don't. Know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and of course there are some analyzers that are not provided in community. Uh, for example, C plus plus and uh, I guess Cobol, uh, Swift. Uh, so people also need, for example, to to buy developer edition if they want to analyze their C plus plus code, and uh, that's actually what people are paying for. And that's for Sonar Coop. And if we're talking about Sonar Cloud, the model is much simpler. You're just, uh, if you want uh, everyone, everybody to have public access to your projects on Sonar Cloud, you're, um, you don't pay. And if you want some private projects, you pay. And the more lines of code you have, the more you pay. <laughs> I love that. That's kind of like, if you want everyone to see how bad your code is, <laughs> you don't have to pay. If you want to... If you want to hide in shame, <laughs> pay us. So, how many how many users uh, do you have? I mean, I mean, both in general, but also specifically for for Kotlin. Well, I I think I, I don't know exactly because like that's uh, uh, something about uh, more sales uh, information. How many people bought it on uh, Sonar uh, Sonar Coop, Which instances and I. Even if it's like available information, it's not something that they have. Uh, but uh, if we're talking about Snare Cloud, uh, I know that in terms of lines of code, we have around 30 millions of lines of code that are actively developed and they are uh, private. So that's, and around 1 they million, which is public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are ashamed. And, and, that's, and that's funny that actually when, when I see the statistics on Sonar, for Sonar Cloud, uh, the uh, like majority of people have their pri private uh, code. They don't want to show it. Hmm. Like, uh, yeah. Now, I, now yeah. I want to know whether there's a correlation between code quality and whether the project is private or not. Whether people who develop out in the open feel the need to make Absolutely, their code more dude. pretty and better or <laughs> or Absolutely. whether well but the other side is you know people who build like who need to build enterprise grade private you know like proprietary stuff maybe they need to make their software much better i don't know <laughs> no i think that the 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 fact that it's open source and exposed to the world you more always eyes. kind of try and yeah more eyes you know and especially now in this industry where you don't need a CV, you just need a GitHub URL, which I completely oppose, but anyway, um, I think that people take more care with that. I, I think that people uh, for more 
of our enter from coming from enterprise, they need to have their like uh, web applications or Android applications uh, private, because like if they go and see the analysis coming from Sooner Cloud and it's like security vulnerabilities or security hotspot, where we actually explain how your uh, web application can be hacked and how you can steal the information, and that's something that uh, should be hidden. Yep. Well. We're running out of time. Actually, we, we, every time I say we're running out of time, it's such a lie because we always go over time. So we are over time. Uh, it's been absolutely great chatting with you. Uh, I do hope that we get to see each other in person at some other event in the future, uh, namely, because uh, then that way I can introduce you to my Quest protein bar, which is similar to How the... many of these do you have? <laughs> Don't ask. Oh, actually, I like Quest bars. Quests are actually quite good. In fact, I've got they, even... They have less sugar as far as I remember. There's also these ones, which are a little bit different to these ones. But Again, apologies to our audio listeners. If you have ever not had this, Ariette, this actually, we do it in a very funny way. We chop it up into little bits, microwave it for one minute, th 10 seconds, then we put it in the oven and they come out like cookies. It is delicious. You should try it. And to all our audience out there, yes, Seb? Yeah. Uh, we're still not sponsored. <laughs> we, we need to. We need to secure that sponsorship. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about yeah. the whole subscribe, Bing Bang. Boom yeah, I know. I know. We're 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 oh. getting to that. Don't worry. I'm oh, just sorry. I'm just taking my time. At this point, you know, the episode's already this long. I mean, everyone knows it already, right? It's like subscribe, hit the bell, leave a couple of positive comments. I read today that apparently the the dislikes uh, on YouTube videos are gonna be private. So people can't see those anymore. So why even bother hitting the dislike button? Just hit the like button. It's it's better for everyone anyway, and, and people can actually see it. Absolutely. And, and very much in line with Sona Source, uh, what we've done, decided to do is, you know, well, YouTube is like, if you want to hide your shame, make it private. That's that's the move to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we, before we sign out... Uh, do you still want to shout anything out uh, or, or places where, where people should maybe go if they if they want to learn more or, or get more things or contribute? Uh, I think that's nice to uh, paste our, a link to our Sonar Kotlin analyzer. Uh, we'll have, we'll uh, have that in the description for sure. Along with young. how to purchase Quest protein bars. <laughs> if they have an affiliate link. <laughs> Yeah, and of course it's open source, so uh, people can contribute. They can uh, um, like propose their ideas of rules and propose what they think we should uh, do. Some other features in Analyzer uh, in our community forum, so maybe community forum also should work. And uh, another point, so uh, I guess we are hiring. So, <laughs> so if you uh, want to like participate in contributing to this open source projects that's uh you can try your and get paid power yeah and get paid for it yeah so you you can try your uh, skills and try to join our team and maybe i'll conduct the interview with you because sometimes i do Ooh, the, well if you do end up uh, in, a, in an interview then make sure that you uh, mention this episode of talking colin as well i'm sure it'll give you bonus points yes in some and, and way. show up with a quest bar because uh, you like quest bars so. yeah with that uh, i think uh, i need to head out and secure us some sponsorships or something else or at least figure out if there's an affiliate link <laughs> so take care everyone and uh, see you in the next one maybe with more protein bars who knows or milkshakes or milkshakes